lands between, shadowed by the luminous herd tree and governed by the Empyrean Queen Merica the Eternal, servant of the Greater Will and vessel of the Elden Ring. But history is rarely so straightforward, and without the ebb and flow of political struggles, war, and heartache, until an age of peace and prosperity settle in. Sleep well, and allow me to weave you a tale in which those who were once spurned are now guided home to restore the Elden Ring. But first, this video is sponsored by me. I've finally gone and gotten proper merchandise done. If you're interested in checking any of that out, including a shirt with this amazing Melania and Mikola artwork done by Jen Designs, and Lord Asleep Two Pillows, just go to the ashenhollow.com to see more. To make sense of this world we tarnished our beck and back to, we must start at the very beginning, before even the sprouting of the Earth Tree. Which brings us to the Outer Gods, and while we're unsure of exactly how many of them there are, and how they each attempt to meddle in the affairs of our realm, we only need to focus on one for now, the Outer God known as the Greater Will. Long ago, the Greater Will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between which would later become the Elden Ring. The power of the Greater Will and the Elden Ring combined would be capable of a great many things, one being the creation of the Erd Tree formed from primordial matter. A grand and radiant tree that would bestow upon the lands between its inhabitants its golden ore of grace, its power sourced from the Elden Ring. Also, through the assistance of the Greater Will, Queen Merica would rise to rule the lands between, and was made the vessel of the Elden Ring itself. The Golden Order was established, and the Age of the Erd Tree had begun. But this age was born amid conflict, as the Golden Order sought to expand the influence of the Greater Will. To bolster her position, Queen Merica took a consort, a great warrior named Hor Lu, who in becoming Merica's husband and subsequently the first Elden Lord, changed his name to Godfrey. In his vow to become a lord, Godfrey took upon his back the Lord of Beasts, Sarosh, to guide him, and to suppress the ceaseless lust for battle that raged within his past self, Horalu. But opposition to the Earth Tree was widespread at the beginning, and it would only become the embodiment of order through countless victories in war. Godfrey was the Lord of the Battlefield and would bring them many victories. But the Golden Order wouldn't hold the lands between through war alone. America needed to ensure that their rule and their order didn't end with her. To this end, she struck with more than a single strategy. With Godfrey as her husband, they would start the Golden Lineage, bringing three demigod children into the world. There was Godwin the Golden, and born graceless with horns adorning their heads were the cursed Omen twins Morgoth and Moog, who were subsequently imprisoned and kept underground, hidden from the rest of the world. But a lineage is only as good for as long as it lasts. America wished for herself and the demigods to have life eternal. Legend says that the Empyreans have wolves for shadows, and Queen Merica was no exception to these shadow-bound beasts. Alakith the Blackblade was the shadow-bound to Merica, and she used her shadow for a sole purpose, to seal away destined death. 
Malekith was a loyal half-brother to Queen Merica, and would imbue destined death within his blade to seal it from the world. And with death sealed, Merica and the demigods could live life eternal. The Order would soon clash with seemingly their most dangerous foe standing in the way of the Lands Between being completely under the influence. This was the war against the Giants, led by Lord Godfrey. The Giants held control over the Flame of Ruin atop one of their snowy peaks, a flame that certainly possessed the power to burn the Earth Tree to the ground and the Golden Order could simply not ignore that looming threat. Especially considering that the Giants were mortal enemies of the Earth Tree. But the Order would and could not be stopped, and the Giants were defeated despite borrowing the power of a fell god to aid in their fight. With their victory over the Giants won, Queen Merica would soon learn that the Flame of Ruin from the giant's forge would never die. So Merica instead inflicted a curse upon the fire giant, so that he would have to tend to his flame for eternity. With the future of the Golden Order cemented and the largest threat to the Earth Tree quelled, Merica set her sights to continue expanding the influence of the Greater Will within the Lands Between. This site would bring war to the region of Liernia, home to the Sorcery Academy of Lea Rucaria and the Carian royal family. The head of both the academy and the royal family was a woman named Renala, an extremely talented sorceress whose lunar magic marked her as the academy's champion and later its master and she would go on to establish the House of Caria as royalty. To lead the upcoming battle for Liernia, Merica would send Radagon at the head of a great golden host. But Radagon is an incredibly interesting character, so much so that it warrants a brief explanation apart from the story. In truth, Radagon was Merica, and Merica was Radagon. They were one and the same. They are two beings residing within one god. This we can learn by casting the Law of Regression incantation in front of Radagon's statue within the Leyendel royal capital to reveal its secrets. Now, there are still unknowns in regards to this revelation. What we do know is that Radagon and Merica were absolutely two separate physical beings. Now, whether they were two beings with a single unified consciousness, or if they each had their own independent from one another, are where things aren't entirely clear. However, it was important to relay that information to you now. The Golden Order's invasion into Liernia would end up being a successful one, but not through the means they had expected. When Radagon met Lady Renala in battle, he would soon after repent his territorial aggressions, swear his love to Renala, and take the Ikarian Queen's hand in marriage. The Golden Order and the Fate of the Moon were conjoined, and through this union, the influence of the Greater Will would preside over Liernia, uniting the provinces of the Lands Between. It is unclear exactly how long this marriage would last, but it was long enough for Radagon and Renala to have three demigod children of their own. Their children were General Radon, Peter Reichard, and Lunar Princess Rani, who was the only Empyrean to be born of the royal lineage thus far. Time would go on, and the lands between maintained the order of the Greater Will. 
but tragedy would fall upon Lord Godfrey. After all the battles he had led and won, after all of the great enemies he had felt, he would face the Storm Lord alone and fell even him. But then there came a moment when his last worthy enemy fell. It is said that it was then that the hue of grace from Lord Godfrey's eyes faded. But in truth, he was robbed of his grace by Queen Merica, for what reason is unknown. But it wasn't just Godfrey whom she divested of grace, but of his warriors too. Consider this dialogue from Melina, as she speaks the words of Merica herself. My lord and thy warriors, I divest each of thee of thy grace. With thine eyes dimmed, you will be driven from the lands between. You will wage war in a land afar, where you will live and die. It was then that Godfrey and his warriors, robbed of their grace, became tarnished and were exiled from the lands between. Godfrey would lead his kinsfolk from the lands between in what would become known as the Long March. And when it came to an end, Godfrey divested himself of kingship and became a simple warrior once more. With Godfrey banished, Radagon would leave Renala to return to America and become her consort as well as the second Elden Lord. But before he left, Radagon bequeathed upon Renala an amber egg containing a great rune. The departure of her husband left Renala heartbroken, and it was then that those at the academy realized that she was no champion at all. The Academy rebelled against the Carian royal family and locked Renala away within the Grand Library, where she was left alone, cradling the Amber Egg. Upon Radagon's return to America, they would conceive two more children, the twins Melania and Mikola, born of a single god, and as such they are both Empyrean but each suffered afflictions from birth. Mikola was afflicted with eternal childhood, and Melania harbored rot within. And time would continue to go on. The two fingers were envoys to the greater will, and thus with their finger maidens sought a candidate one day succeed Queen Merica and become the new god of the coming age. Melania, Mikola, and Rani, the only demigods that could claim the title of Imperium, were the only natural choices. But Rani would not acquiesce to the two fingers. She would instead take another direction leading us to the Night of the Black Knives. In conspiring with the Black Knife assassins, Ronnie would steal away with the Rune of Death from Malekith, and through ritual imbued the assassin's blades with its power. And in the Night of the Black Knives, with their death-imbued blades, the assassins murdered Godwin the Golden, bringing the first taste of death to the demigods. But in truth, two demigods perished that night. While Godwin was murdered and perished in soul, Rani was the first demigod whose flesh would perish. But Rani did not die. She slew her own Empyrean flesh as to not be controlled by the fate of the greater will had planned for her. She would instead house her soul into a doll, modeled after the snow witch that had once mentored her. The Golden Order had been struck a devastating blow, 
the death of one of their own. Alakith would bind his blade of destined death within his own flesh, so that none might ever rob death again. He'd then disguise himself and take on another identity, perhaps to safeguard death that much more. Godwin, the first dead of the demigods, would be taken and buried at the roots of the great tree. But this would ultimately spell more trouble for the Golden Order, as the power of the Rune of Death would spread from Godwin's wounds into the roots of the tree. This would later spread the Rune of Death across the lands between, through the roots and sprouting the death roots throughout the realm. And these death roots would give rise to those who live in death. Yet another plight in defiance of the greater will. Heartbroken over the loss of her child, Queen Merica would soon become disillusioned with the greater will. And it's believed to be in her grief she was driven to the brink. She would bring her hammer down and shatter the Elden Ring. And while Radagon simultaneously attempted to repair it, his endeavor would be in vain. The Elden Ring was shattered. And we learn from the Two Fingers the Greater Will's thoughts of Queen Merica. Queen Merica is the vessel of the Elden Ring, carrier of its vision, a god in truth. But after the Elden Ring shattering, she was imprisoned in the Erd Tree, a grim punishment for shattering the Order, despite her godhood. The fingers speak. America's trespass demanded a heavy sentence. But even in shackles, she remains a god and the vision's vessel. With the Elden Ring shattered and America imprisoned, everything within the lands between was turned upside down. The great runes, the shattered pieces of the Elden Ring, were claimed by America's offspring, demigods all. But the mad taints of their newfound power would trigger a war. The Shattering. A war in which sibling would raise armies against one another. A war in which there could be no victory. But not every demigod would fight. Some would claim their great ruins and turn their attention to different goals. Rikard would allow himself to be devoured by a great serpent, so that he might devour along with it and grow and live eternally. He spent his time devouring countless heroes that would become a part of him, in hopes that they would all together one day devour the very gods. Other demigods, like Godric the Crafted, had quite different ideas on how to conduct themselves. First, he hid himself among the women folk to flee the capital, then hid from her dawn in that castle. Then he insulted Melania, lost to her in battle, only to lick her boots rather than die like a man. He has no shame, a big girl's blouse, and to think he's the blood of Godfrey, last of the golden lineage, though you almost wouldn't know it to look at him. But even when the mightiest demigods, General Radon and Melania met in battle, still none would leave the victor. 
they would leave nothing but devastation and rot in their wake, poisoning the land of Caelid. None would claim the title of Elden Lord, so all they had gained was a fractured world and the abandonment of the Greater Will. The Greater Will has long renounced the demigods, Garnished, show no mercy. Have their heads, take all they have left. During the ensuing chaos of the Shattering, the twin Omen brothers Morgoth and Moog, once banished beneath the capital, would find their escape. Though each brother had vastly different ideas on how they would spend their newfound freedom. Morgoth, though he was never loved by the Greater Well or the Erd Tree, still loved it all the same and dedicated himself to becoming its protector and becoming the rightful king of the Leyendale capital. Moog would put his faith in a different outer god altogether, the Formless Mother, who showed him the strength in his accursed blood. To this end, Moog would steal Mikalu away from his Halig tree while in his cocoon form. Moog wished to raise Mikala to full godhood so that he could become his consort and take on the role of monarch. But ultimately, he would never receive a response from the young Empyrean, regardless of how much of his bloody bedchamber he shared. The world was in turmoil, broken and bruised. The greater will abandoned the demigods just as they had broken the tenets of the Golden Order during the Shattering. To restore the Golden Order, the Greater Will extended its grace back to the once exiled Tarnished, so that grace might grant them life and lead them through the fog back into the lands between, to be guided by the Two Fingers, to rid the demigods of their great ruins, and to stand before the Elden Ring after conferring great runes and becoming the Elden Lord, joining Queen Merica as her consort and restoring the Golden Order and the lands between. But there are many different ways to repair the Elden Ring, and many factions who wish to do so to restore the world in a new image no longer under the influence of the Erd Tree. And so it all comes down to the Tarnished who would become the next Elden Lord. Will you make the world anew, conferring great runes bestowed upon you by would-be blasphemers? Or would you restore the Golden Order through the guidance of the Two Fingers? Inherit the broken lands between, and make your choice, ye tarnished, ye dead who yet live. <laughs>